My name is Jennifer Gray Thompson, and I am the CEO of After the Fire. Welcome to the podcast, How to Disaster, Recover, Rebuild, and Reimagine. In this podcast, we bring you the very best practices, best hearts, and great ideas from other disaster-affected communities. Thank you for joining us. We're back for another episode of the How to Disaster podcast, where we help you recover, rebuild, and reimagine. Today, our guest is Will Higgard, the Operations Director for the Footprint Project, an organization that brings power generation to disaster-affected areas, establishes microgrids, and uses novel ideas to respond to cleaner and build back greener. We're happy to bring Will on the program today to hear from his experience, and we'll touch upon the important subjects of microgrids in disaster response how to finance it all, and crisis management. As we know, when a disaster strikes, power infrastructure can be damaged and inoperable. The Footprint Project uses these opportunities to not only help the recovery go smoother, but also improve resilience in rebuilding. We're glad to have you along for the show, and please take a look at the description section to find out more about the Footprint Project or visit www.footprintproject.org. Once again, welcome to the podcast, Will. Hi, this is uh, such a pleasure to be here. Well, you know, I'm really excited because, you know, I've been working in disaster for almost five years. And one of the things that I'm really curious about is, you know, maintaining connectivity, power, all of those things. And you work in a very unique space. So can you talk to us about the Footprint Project? Yeah, thanks, Jen. Um, so the Footprint Project is a small nonprofit that our mission is to help communities build back greener after disasters by mobilizing cleaner energy to communities in crisis. So normally that looks like uh, offsetting, replacing, or displacing single source fossil fuel generators in the field for first and second responders, as well as community or mutual aid workers, so the neighbors down the street, um, with mobile solar generators. And when I say a mobile solar generator, that could literally mean a truck box with a couple batteries and an, and an inverter and some solar panels up to some very, very fancy mobile microgrids that are either forkliftable or towable or containerized. Um, but it really, at the end of the day, it's just creating a different access or a way to plug in to electrons and provide usable 120 volt AC power for uh, disaster relief in areas that are most affected by climate disasters. Well, I want to really go through the definitions of everything that you just said, because some people will know what some of that means and some people will know what really none of that means, but I'd really like to hear about the origins of the footprint project. Like how did this come about? Yeah, I'm happy to let, I'll start with the story and then maybe we can go into the, I love talking tech, but I think the, the, the general concepts are, are relatively simple. So I'm going to try to keep the stuff, keep it simple as we generally like to say in disasters. Um, we got started um, doing this. It really came out of some of the work I did after um, college, I got my paramedic license, did EMT and ambulance work, and then was deployed with International Medical Corps as a logistics manager and then a program manager um, during the Ebola outbreak. And I came into a, a program funded by the CDC in Guinea, West Africa. And it was, we were really, the, you know, grant was to support five rural lab um, clinics with uh, generators and then refrigerators and training to store, test, take blood samples for to test for five diseases. So we were going to buy a generator, put in a fridge, train them to draw blood, train them to put that blood on a motorcycle, send it to Conakry where the national lab would test it and then text them the results. That was the plan for the year. It, I came into that program and we were looking at, all right, do we do a cash transfer or reimbursement program in five rural lab clinics for you know fuel to power the generator to power the fridge to store the blood you know like it was just this classic 
disaster power challenge. And we, I'd heard of solar powered refrigerators. Like I'd heard that they exist. I had no really clue what they did or how much they cost. And I asked our local logistics person to go out and see if there was a quote. And he came back the next day, I remember it, with three quotes. All of the re solar refrigerators were available in Conakry for installation that month. And they would cost like $5,000 while the generator plus monthly gas was like $2,000 and then a couple hundred bucks a month for the gas. And that, that was assuming that there wasn't, weren't going to be any problems with corruption or getting the cash to the person or just like all of those other things that could get weird in the, one of the poorest countries on the planet. So we went with the, the solar refrigerators and I burned out after seven months and I left that mission kind of like wondering why the grant was written that way in the first place and why there wasn't any incentive for uh, response organizations to utilize uh, more sustainable technologies in the field. And that kind of sent us down this rabbit hole or sent me down this rabbit hole of you know, why solar generators aren't utilized in the domestic U.S., particularly for fire stations or DMATs or other large, um, you know, response teams for on-site power. And it really comes down to the cost of the equipment is still high. There is a lack of awareness or understanding of how the equipment works, what it can do, how to use it, how to plug in, what to ask for as a responder. And then even if the, you have the equipment, there's a logistics challenge. People, you know, you're, you're the logistician that's working the fossil fuel generator pro, you know, supply chain at a firehouse in rural Homa, Louisiana, right after Ida, there's not, they haven't been trained on how to run a microgrid. So that's, a, you know, there's a couple key gaps. One of it's money-based one of its awareness based and one of its just on-site training. And so we're, we started Footprint Project to try to fill those gaps. So, you know, what I, I really like, uh, I really like it, by the way. I just want to say that oh, because thank you. having undergone a disaster and which is how I got started in this business is um, I had no idea how vulnerable our infrastructure was until it was, you know, taken out until communication systems were down, there was no power yeah. um, and the air was filled with, you know, poison and smoke. And then you're like, oh, looks like a lot of things that I took for granted um, that that would be an inappropriate uh, preparation. Magical thinking, it turns out, is not great preparation. So mm -hmm. I love that you took this really basic fundamental thing that people need, and then you turned it into a project that is a nonprofit. So kudos to you. How long have you been around? We started this, uh, we found it in 2018. Um, most of our work through 2018, kind of to 2020, was basically begging for free lithium batteries and then cobbling those onto trailer frames or like portable boxes and then in a specific region and then just deploying them as quickly as possible during a regional large power outage disaster. Uh, and then in 2021, we kind of, that was really the moment where we got a little traction, I would say, where it wasn't just kind of us doing it in my garage and stuff, but, um, uh, Hurricane Ida was our largest deployment ever, and we had a bunch of other companies kind of send equipment and jump in as as partners. So that that was really exciting. Um, but yeah, it's still really small in the sense that you know access to electricity, particularly sustainable electricity, or more cleaner. You say it's not clean; it's cleaner, right? Mm -hmm. There's always a cost. Um, is just you know, there's just not that many solar generators out there and particularly not very many that can do the things that responders need them to do. And there's not many people that know how to drive them around, troubleshoot them, plug in. Like it's just, there's, it's a really, the 
mobile off-grid solar battery game is a very, very, very small network of people. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. You know, I would I would tell you that I'm surprised, but I'm also surprised to find myself running the the you know the biggest and only nonprofit solely dedicated to wildfire. So in the United <laughs> yeah. States, and I'm all I'm like, yeah, I mean, we know a lot of stuff, but I, are you sure? You know, that I feel yeah. that way all the time. Like, really? Yeah. I mean, come on now, other people, come on in. Um, yeah, you know, exactly. join us. Water's warm. <laughs> I know water's warm, and the need is is huge, and it's that basic yeah. fundamental thing that I like so much. So I'd love it if you would describe your deployment into Hurricane Ida, and then I will, and then talk to us about like the logistics of it because you know a lot of people have very good ideas, but executing those good ideas is not something that's that common. And you know, nonprofits are also businesses, and you know, mm-hmm. and you're so you are delivering your service, but you're also making sure that your business practices are appropriate. So talk to me about like, so Hurricane Ida happens and then what? Yeah. And I, I like one that was our, by far the thing we got, we've gotten the most attention for so far. So love to talk about it. Um, and I think it also kind of shared the why we were able to do it is reflective of kind of our, um, our general business model which we're trying we're still kind of working on obviously but um we have three programs one of them is disaster relief right deploy everything that we know that's not just a single source generator to um community resilience sites after disasters right in a specific region second program is kind of in the early to long-term recovery where we build new solar generators with repurposed electrical components and get them ready in a region for the next disaster. And that usually looks like training, assembling new community accessible solar generators, and then deploying them for fun events. So either renting them to festivals or powering up, you know, community, any event where we're using a solar generator in an area is a resilience event to us. Um, And then our third program kind of bucket is solar waste recovery. So we incorporate upcycled and repurposed electrical components, batteries, solar panels, inverters, all of that tech, that hardware that large or larger solar companies might send to a landfill into these builds. So it, so we can build it for next to nothing and then get a new system kind of in this fleet of um, Frankenstein solar generator things that are that are floating around so we were in Tennessee right when Ida hit we were there renting equipment to the Bonnaroo Music and Arts Festival in Tennessee which is a pretty big kind of a a music festival there and it actually got flooded out because we were setting up solar trailers to power these a stage and some other um, spaces when the kind of the tail end or the hurricane kind of made landfall in New Orleans. We were talking to community partners there. And when when they were like, yeah, the power is about to go out, we definitely will need this equipment. And we were like, we'll get there as soon as possible afterwards. The We were still under contract, right? So we couldn't just like grab everything and leave. Um, but we actually, the, the the festival was canceled like last minute because the, the, it got flooded. Like the, the whole camping farm space where it's held, they couldn't set up, people couldn't set up tents. The, there was just massive amounts of mud. It was just like raining for three days in, during the setup. We literally have like photos and videos of us like pulling these trailers in and then getting the announcement that it was canceled on. This was like 48 hours after Ida made landfall. And we hitched everything up and, and packed it all up and we were in driving to New Orleans within I think I want to say like 18 hours of getting canceled. So then we took all that equipment out. We were there by Friday. So the hurricane hits Sunday. We were driving in New Orleans on Friday. By that time, New Orleans was out of power for another couple of days. In certain parts it was longer, but we quickly learned that there was a lot more devastation and the power, you know, outage problem was more in the, you know, farther south into the Gulf. Um, so we moved all, all the equipment that we had deployed from Tennessee just south. And as we were driving in from Tennessee, we were doing the classic, you know, 
get building our site list, building our part, you know, who are we talking to? Who is requesting power? Who doesn't have, you know, access to resources to, to buy a generator or pay for gas or do all these things, right? Like if the National Guard's sending in gas, we're going to the people that aren't talking to the National Guard, right? Um, so we're doing that as we're driving down. We got a call from the um, uh, disaster program uh, manager at Tesla, and he was like, we have these palletized mm -hmm. microgrids. We're going to send, like, if we send these to the, to you, can you help us in, in New Orleans? Can you help us find these right sites? And we were like, absolutely send them. And that kind of bubbled into our largest deployment to date where we had our equipment that we deployed. And then as these, uh, as other companies said, oh, you know, hey, I have this solar, there was two solar companies in New Orleans that had solar trailers that were sitting around as kind of, marketing pieces and each one of those is a generator right mm -hmm. so we grabbed those and brought those way south it kind of just expanded off of our initial kind of we got our three units down and a bunch of portable systems and um once you know there was a little bit of a program or something to grasp onto for other companies to say hey i have this thing in my warehouse that might be useful right do you guys, can you guys deploy it? We're kind of, kind of became the, the team that can say like, send us the spec sheet, right? <laughs> Let's not deploy trash. Mm -hmm. um, and, but if it can produce usable power and can prevent uh, or offset another single source gas or diesel generator from running, Let's find a place to to power it up, whether that's for like a, a single Wi-Fi hotspot or a cell phone charging station or a mobile incident command center. You know what I mean? This stuff ranges from very small, but very tactical up to very large, very expensive and very, you know, technical, if that makes sense. It does make sense. Um, for those people who don't know, even though we've talked about it on this uh, program before, but can you define what a microgrid is? Yeah, so we define a micro, one, I think the definition of microgrid is still pretty loosey goosey. So <laughs> I'm going to use my definition of a microgrid Fair. or our definition. And so we define microgrid as an energy, you know, a usable energy source that is producing regular electricity, usable electricity out of an outlet that pulls from multiple sources of production. So whether that's the grid or a generator or solar or wind or hydrogen or nuclear or whatever pick a thing that produces power you running on a treadmill or biking whatever pulls from more than one source of electrical production and can store that power right so most microgrids have a battery or some form of energy storage so we define it as just a generator that has multiple sources of generation and can store power. Um, so, you know, one of the things that when I, when, um, when I, my staff and I are talking about the work that we do and I, I and, you know, I'm always like, you know, we're not a social justice organization. Um, we do mm. equity. Uh, that's really important to me. And equity for us looks like when we walk into a community, like what do the, what do the people in front of us need in order to recover, rebuild and reimagine? And, and so the, you know, the demographic of what that looks like changes dramatically um, dependent upon the disaster, where it happens, who it happens to, all of those things. It occurs to me that very much the work that you're doing um, has to do with something I love, which is doing equity and doing social justice. Can you talk about the kind of need that you see out there and how the Footprint Project actually fills that need? Yeah, um, I think what we didn't really know going into this little thing that has become something slightly bigger. Um, we didn't know that like the people that would be using this equipment or requesting it oftentimes do not have access or cannot fund. They're not the ones with a backup generator in the first place. Like there's a lot of people out there that do not have the money to buy a generator when the grid goes out, much less fill up the gas tank, much less, stand in line or drive their car to get gas and wait in the line and then drive back 
And those are the people that are often the ones that either die or know someone who has died because of either lack of access to electricity during a critical power outage. So like, you know, medically vulnerable folks, folks that rely on all of these, um, you know, medical devices or insulin storage for, you know, refrigerators, all of these things that, that people just don't have the, the resources to, to fill that energy gap. And we often talk about energy access as an international problem. It's not. I mean, the reality is that the U.S. has some of the worst power outage, you know, problems of any developed country. And a lot of what we are doing is not we're not sending this stuff to West Africa. We're deploying it to southern Louisiana. You know what I mean? Like it's and a lot of what we're doing is taking technology and and these solutions that are being developed in Africa where places in places where the grid is not, or, you know, where the telephone poles are not set up and won't ever be set up. You know what I mean? Develop taking that tech and those solutions that, that the quote unquote developing world are, are building and applying them to our local domestic power outage challenges so i think i don't know i don't know what i'm trying to get at here but it's like the there is a the equity lens or or whatever we want to call it on energy access i think it, there where we oftentimes assume that this is something that we can export and really it's learning from people that have experienced these these challenges already and are building solutions for themselves and finding ways to connect the dots between other folks really next door or down the street from us that do not have the access to most of the resources that we and by we i mean myself you and other people that are like you know can afford to get in their car and drive and get out or buy a tesla or whatever um so yeah, I don't know how that, how, I don't know if no, I it, you know, her, it, but. I think that it's an important, you don't have to have the perfect answer for it. That is actually <laughs> the perfect answer in my brain, because, you know, that's why we talk about doing rather than talking about it, because what we see out, uh, disaster sort of reveals a lot of inequities. Like in rural America, you can't, even in rural California, you can own land and you can live off of $25,000 a year, as long as you don't have a mortgage for that land, or even if you do, it can be very low. Because most people think of California, they think San Francisco, Los Angeles, mm -hmm. or I live in Sonoma County, exorbitant land value. But yeah. a lot of California, that's not the case. And a lot of America, that's not the case. So people can exist. But then a disaster comes through. And in our case, a wildfire, which is different from wind and rain. And, you know, all of a sudden their house is gone. The forest around them where they got their heating supply is also mm -hmm. gone. And now they're just another person in America who's trying to live off $25,000 a year and they're homeless. And, yeah. you know, this is our um, inequities and the, and our vulnerabilities are revealed by disaster, but they were there before too. And so yeah. when you come in with a solution for them, I really love that. And I also, I love the conversation that some things that we think are for other countries, like, oh, we're benevolent America. We are a very benevolent, yeah. you know, benevolent country, but the idea that we don't have huge needs around sanitation and energy access and food security right here at home is, um, it's just an incorrect notion. It's why I, it's why for my younger son, like we're taking him all around America during high school when I'm not taking him, you know, to Africa because I know there's need in Africa and we'll get there. But I want to yeah. also show him that, you know, we have a lot of um, things going on here that have to be addressed and it's ideas, um, executed ideas, not just thinking about it, but executed ideas like yours that will actually get us there, which is why I wanted to have you on the podcast today, because oh, I love really that. Sweet. I really do. Well, I appreciate that. I mean, like, it's, I think we're learning a lot as we do this, like every one, every disaster is different. The needs of one you know, we we sent some of the equipment that was deployed during Hurricane Ida up to Kentucky during the Kentucky winter storm. 
we were trying to get back home to Minnesota for Christmas. And it happened that it was like, <laughs> right, you know, right as we're about to leave the Kentucky winter storm hit. And we had all this equipment that had been demobilized from Southern Louisiana. Power came back on the churches or the community centers or whatever said, Hey, we don't need this anymore. We actually, can you get it out of our parking lot trying to have <laughs> church again, you know, like, um, and so it was staged. So we sent it up there and we set it, you know, set it up and a lot of, you know, it was cold. It was rainy for a lot of the week. You know, this tech, the tech is only going to solve it to a point, right? Like it's a bet it's, it's the right direction, but a, a lot of, you know, you're not going to run a community like center or a school for a deep freeze disaster off of a solar microgrid, right? Like the battery is not, unless you have a $2 million containerized battery system, right? That you could deploy within 20 minutes or whatever, two hours. It's, it's not feasible. Like, so we're, we're, I think kind of coming up against this, Hey, what is doing the, the, professional response look like and what do the firefighters need versus how do you you know how do you deploy equipment in for a community that might not have any of that you know they, their fire department isn't around or the you know the low income old folks home that has water on the floor like maybe we're not going to be able to get the building on but if we can get a small battery pack or a battery library set up outside the building then they can bring a, you know charge their phone and run their nebulizer at night and like it's kind of sucks that like that's the win you know that we're like supposedly I, the I don't think that's I don't think that sucks though and I mean it's, it's here's the thing is that we underestimate we undervalue iterative um iterative help and iterative processes mm. that actually can get us to the other side it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean you shouldn't be asking for the two million dollar solution as well <laughs> yes ask for that for sure but when there is nothing for you and your phone has died and you have to communicate with your family to tell them that you're going to be okay, or they can check in on you or, uh, you know, communication is, uh, is such a critical, um, need during a disaster for emotional reasons and for practical reasons. And I often think about this, um, documentary that I saw about paradise and we've been working in paradise since about eight to 10 days post disaster, but mm -hmm. I'm a firefighter who, you know, he and he, his wife left to take the kids to school. And then he left to go to work in the morning. And because wildfire takes out all of the, um, cell towers and power, then for the next eight hours, he didn't know if his wife had made it and she didn't know if he made it. Mm -hmm. And that is an, an, you know, that's like one of those uh, things that is, that can be solved. Like we can't solve everything. We just can't, but we can yeah. do iterative um, progress. Then when you can show proof of concept for something smaller, I think it builds leverage for the $2 million ask. And I have to pause here for a commercial break and we're going to come right back. Sounds good. Fannie Mae provides mortgage options for you and your family. If you have a mortgage owned by Fannie Mae, you may have financial options available after a disaster, such as forbearance plans, deferral of payments, lending assistance, and counseling. Find out more from our Disaster Response Network. Go online at www.knowyouroptions.com relief or call 1-877-833-1746. Um, so, you know, just to get back to what I was saying before we went on commercial break, I don't just, I, you know, express frustration. Like that's, I totally get that, but don't, I caution you against, um, downplaying the value, especially to the people who've just undergone a disaster of showing up with a way to say, Hey, I'm going to help you call your family mm -hmm. and I'm going to help you with your medication. So, but what's your big dream for this organization? I have a feeling oh, I, I just heard it. No, that's really one kind. I mean, I think the reality is that most of what we do is charge phones and run small chest freezers and mini fridges. Like that's the the bread and butter of this because the from a technical standpoint or an electron standpoint, it's really easy to run 
charge cell phones, run small laptops, Wi-Fi hotspots, anything small communications devices, super doable with a solar generator. Then once you get up to small scale refrigeration, AC gets really tricky if you're doing air conditioning and heat is really hard to do off of the sole so solar just batteries, no backup generator, fossil fuel generator. So one, I think, yeah, I don't want to discount that work because it is critical and we do get like, that's the stuff that makes us keep doing it. <laughs> um, <laughs> like seeing those stories of someone saying like, hey, yeah, I used your solar generator charger thing to power my electric wheelchair or charge my phone for my family. And then I got to talk to them and like that, that keeps us going. You know what I mean? Yeah. The, the, I mean, I, and I'm going to, I'm shooting big on this whole thing, but we need to decarbonize disaster relief. I mean, the reality is particularly in the domestic U S most of our disasters are climate related. So if we're, we are in a very tricky, we put ourselves in a very tricky position where if we're using the problem to tr as the solution, right. If we're deploying, if all of our response is powered by fossil fuels, so we're driving trucks, we're sending, getting on planes, we're sending pallets of fossil, you know, water bottles that are plastic. If, you know, if all of our help that we're saying we're going to do is going to cause the next one, are we really helping? Like that's the, I think it's, it's slightly philosophical, but really it's getting more and more practical by the year. And I think that every, particularly anybody that's been through a wildfire or who is prepping for this year's hurricane season or wildfire season, you know, there's this kind of point where it's like, how are we going to break this negative feedback loop? Because oh, if we don't, if we can't figure out how to break it, we're not going to make it. <laughs> you know what I mean? If we're going to do the same thing over and over again, and the disaster is going to get worse, and we're going to raise a bunch of money, and we're going to buy a bunch of single source generators, and we're going to put a bunch of people on planes, and we're going to go over and give out candy bars and bottled water and help, and then run all that stuff on the same things that we know are going to cause the next one. What the hell are we doing? Like, it's not going to get, definitely not going to get better that way. Um, and so I think we have that's a an opportunity, though, too, is, um, to, you know, if you invert that, you know, totally I'm now speaking your language about inverters, I, I have an <laughs> inverter, I love them very much, um, that what an opportunity to make the case, though, for the solar, for um, cleaner running vehicles, and I do anticipate that um, especially with the uh, the big um, car companies and truck companies really sort of racing towards and you know abandoning fossil fuels, I think mm -hmm. we're actually going to get out of a lot of this through the private sector more so than the public sector. You know, it, you can incentivize, but then you, yeah. you you know reach up against it turns political when you're like this is really isn't political. This is just yeah. like smart, yeah. and. Um, and, you know, and the irony is not lost on me of anything you're saying, because when I started this job, I drove a Volvo, an SUV Volvo, right? Not mm -hmm. even a new one, quite frankly. And rolling into middle America in my Volvo SUV, turns out, made me a little unpopular. And so <laughs> I had to trade it in, and now I drive a Dodge Ram, or Ram 1500 yep. big-ass truck. And I do that because... Sounds like a sweet truck. I it's, love, a, I, I, love, I, love a, I love a big truck though. <laughs> like, my God, I love a big truck so much. So yeah, and you know, I, I they they gave me one at Enterprise when I in Los Angeles because they're like, this yeah. is all we have, and I was like, are you kidding? And then I got in it, and I was like, oh, <laughs> this is this is great. So I totally love yeah. my big truck, um, and I love that it does like half the work for me with rural yeah. America, but I also. Yeah really I'm looking forward to the day that I'm not constantly like not I, I barely drive now because I'm so because of the mm -hmm. the uh, the carbon footprint is so high on that thing um but, but we looking... use diesel trucks to tow solar trailers so like well I mean the reality is that you know we can't like we're just scratching the surface of what 
we need to do to but make we have this to be transition. The change, but yes. we're, get, we're getting there. I'm just, totally. I think we're all going to have, you know, you know, in just a couple of years or within five to seven years, having an electric truck that or a hybrid is going yeah. to be um, fiscally uh, reasonable because trucks are intensely expensive. All of you out there who are like, oh, thank God that you're more down home now that you drive a truck. Well, it costs three times what my volume. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> But that's like something that I see as a as an opportunity for you and and for the entire space. And I think it's I rarely hear your point of view brought up in disaster to de to decarbonize it though. So I appreciate that point of view. Well, thank you. And I think the like I I can I feel like I can sound very very depressing, and I don't want to <laughs> sound super depressing because at the same time as like the what the hell are we doing as responders if we can't figure out how to do our job better and do less harm? Like, let's just be honest about the harm that we're doing as we try to help because no one helps perfectly, right? We're all, you know, fragile, broke, somewhat broken, and we're trying to help, but that doesn't, you know sometimes we don't do it right like sometimes we're giving out candy bars to people that needed cash right or someone you know what i mean like there's just we can do this better and there's i think the response community as a whole needs a little bit more of a like a look in the mirror and realize it's 20 you know 22 and we got to get better at what we've been doing for the last 60 years but at the same time there's also huge opportunities to like roll for us it's rolling in even a small a single solar panel and a small battery by a community center to power a little charging station what is the quantitative effect of that is pretty negligible right i mean you'll charge some phones maybe people will be able to get get a hold of their loved ones that's great but there's the thing we can't measure we can measure how many people showed up to charge their phones or how much carbon we might have offset if we weren't using a truck to deliver it right but <laughs> right. The, yeah because we don't have an electric vehicle that can drive that far but uh, the qualitative effect the 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 potential like the conversations that start when someone says hey my neighborhood has just been completely destroyed and as we're going to talk to our representatives i remember charging my phone off of that little solar thing right like the little pieces of it that start the conversation around okay what does it mean to build back and what do we want in our community when we're building back after everything has been leveled or destroyed mm -hmm. or that moment i think is the real the where the magic happens and if we can get those more sustainable or just better aid in faster the the not the ripple effects for the whole long-term recovery process, I think changes. And you, we've seen it happen where people are, you know, people that would not have ever touched a solar panel or ever thought of, who don't believe in global warming, climate, whatever, all of this, they're setting up these systems with us because they need electricity. Mm -hmm. And the, the difference is set this thing up or, Stay, drive three hours and and wait two hours longer to get gas and then drive back right if they have the money to do it right so and the money to do it every day too i mean yeah. you know it's not like it's a yeah i mean that's it and, and there's also the argument like the sun is free <laughs> yeah you and know? i mean it's just the even aside from those practical like suit there are super practical logistical benefits of resilient or cleaner power systems, right? Microgrids that have multiple sources of energy generation, whether that's sun, wind, fossil fuels, whatever. There's really practical benefits, but I think the less like the ones we don't really, we can't track yet, and but we kind of see anecdotally are those, like the conversation with the church leader that has been running their fridge off of a solar generator for two weeks and then is interested in getting solar on the roof of their church before the next hurricane, right? Like they, there's no other way you would like that person now has seen it. They've seen it work. Sometimes it doesn't always work, but, but overall, I think that's the, that's the reason we work on it. And I want to challenge the response community to do better and to particularly the, the domestic response community to look at the solutions that are working abroad and bring them back to serve our own communities, but also like 
the goal is to build, be more resilient. And so that isn't just tech. It's not just the next best perfect toy. It's the conversation that gets started by bringing even a really small new toy into a space that has never seen, you know, a solar panel before, like never seen one up close, never held one, never moved one around. And that's like that awareness thing that's like some weird hearts and minds stuff that you, that is very, very rewarding to do. Well, I want to get into two pieces. The first one is I want to talk about qualitative outcomes because those are incredibly hard to measure as a nonprofit, but a lot of times what funders want, they want inputs. And Mm -hmm. I've been sort of railing against that a little bit. Like, well, what is, what do you want me to do with these inputs? Like, what would you like to accomplish if I give you these inputs and I'm happy to do so, what yeah. kind of outcome are you trying to fund, right? And mm-hmm. if the outcome that they want to fund is that, you know, more people have touch, um, you know, depoliticize the clean energy market, that's a huge one by, you know, taking the politics out of it, quite frankly. But, you know, having experience, understanding that it's easier, um, it's more mm-hmm. pleasant to stand near. There's like a whole host of pleasantries that yeah. can come with solar yeah. that don't exist with uh, fossil fuel generators. Um then asking you how many people charge their phone is probably not the best measure of that, you know, but yeah. instead, like, what's the larger opportunity? What's the community like that you are, you know, what are the communities like that you're serving or the or five top communities last year? And, and then, and then it's slow. And that's one of the things yeah. like there's some immediate immediacy to qualitative outcomes, but can you talk about that as a challenge um, to inform funders? Yeah, it's, I mean, to be honest, we've been a little lucky to date where we haven't had too much like, like the people, the groups that are funding us and the way we've gotten off the ground are kind of get it already. Like we're not really, we're trying to develop our metrics for ourselves. Like we want to know, hey, if we tow this solar generator 200 miles and then leave it for two months, was it worth towing it there in the first place from a carbon standpoint, right? No one really, to be honest, we haven't had a funder really want to know that yet. No one, you know, disaster, right? Which is unique. Yeah, Yeah. I've I've kind of been, we've been wanting to fund that research and like get more reflective with, all right, maybe we shouldn't deploy this, you know, maybe we should only deploy within 50 miles instead of 200 miles Mm -hmm. because, the the cost benefit environmentally from a footprint whatever footprint standpoint is um not worth it but the to date we've sadly been doing trying to do that metric development ourselves without like a demand from from donors yet Mm -hmm. we're trying to get ahead of it the i think the qualitative side that's where the reason we're able to do this work still is because to, to be blunt, solar companies like photos of their logo next to solar panels behind in front right. of a destroyed house. Right. Like, and I am, if that's what it takes, so be it. Like yeah. that's, but they're that's going the to be reason part of the solution, around. though. You know, the solar companies totally. are going to be part of the solution though. So like, um, I'm, I don't care if a utility wants to give me money or an insurance company, cause it's not going to affect my ethos at all. You know, yep. it just doesn't like, it doesn't affect who I, who I'm, you know, how I'm going to speak frankly or bluntly about what the problem is. And they are part, they have a vested interest in the solution. It's, it's not necessarily going to be like a, you know, H and M co- clothes company is not ever going to be interested in what I do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So exactly. I, I think it's fine. What are your, what's sort of your, um, you know, what is sort of your plan or do you have a plan or experience with wildfires? Yeah. So we've done a couple wildfire responses and they've been very, very small, to be honest. Like our, the, our best, I'd say wins are in places like, you know, use the, our, our example of, uh, we have a solar trailer staged with Steamboat Springs Fire Department and we've deployed it out there, what is it, last eight, you know, a year ago, a little more than a year ago. And basically it's a free loan, like a long-term, hey, this is still our piece of equipment. Use it. Um, tell us what you think about it. Deploy it. 
um, we're not liable, you know, sign our liability waiver, but you're not, we're not charging you for the use of this equipment. Mm-hmm. Um, and they've deployed it to a couple of different wildfires to power instant command spaces in super remote regions. And then they also, what's really interesting, I think about that, that um, partnership and the tech, particularly with, you know, firefighters that do this, you know, first response or wildfire response regularly is that they are when we talked to them, they're like, we wouldn't have done one deployment was for the grid went out in Steamboat Springs in an RV park where community members, you know, the, the poor people of Steamboat Springs. And they were trying to figure out how to help. And they brought the solar trailer over with some fridges and just left the fridges, op- you know, on site running. And it was just a community refrigerating refrigeration station had some fans running there. The residents of the RV park were, were without power for like a couple months because there was like a line issue with the, whatever, like a transformer or something. And, but they refused to leave because they had nowhere else to go. Um, so it's but usually like, it's also, there's an attachment though to place that I think yeah. people underestimate. Um, hundred mm-hmm. percent. Yeah. And regardless of why they choose, chose to stay in the heat during the summer, what we learned, what we heard from the Zemo Springs fire chief was that they wouldn't have never, they wouldn't have ran a generator to power community fridges for this, in this RV park, right? But it's like this piece of equipment is a new tool in the toolbox. It's not necessarily replacing other tools. Sometimes it is, but they wouldn't have ever done that, that program, Mm -hmm. quote unquote, if they hadn't mm-hmm. have had this asset. So it's like kind of like EVs and I, I think in traditional vehicles where we're going to see the use of vehicles change, right? right? Like maybe people won't own them. Maybe we'll just all Uber all the time and they'll be whatever. In but the like sky, the, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Personal in impersonal um, little personal helicopters. Could exactly. Be, it's right. And ahead. it's, and so that's, so that's one story that is you know the this is small stuff compared to something like a hurricane either response where we had a long duration power outage that was you know hurricane hits and then the relatively clear sunny skies for you know the time after and it's you're going you know kind of where the the grid rebuild is going to start you know in the major urban centers but then trickle down to the the real fingerling spaces um and so we do have 11 solar trailers, some of which are functioning, some of which aren't in Northern California that are pre-staged for wildfires. We Our best responses have been with fire departments. And we have one with like Calaveras Ferris County that's been used for the South Lake Tahoe fire. I mean, it's still drop in the bucket for a fire camp right now. We're not, it's not like we're bringing in two megawatt hours of batteries and a, setting up a football field of solar panels to power the incident, you know, 2000 person fire camp, which is what should be happening, but, but we're I not, think that not is, there yet. I do think that's but, where we're headed though. And I, I've, I've totally. seen a big change in how people talk about, um, you know, climate resiliency um, since 2020, big change, mm-hmm. huge change, like far less political, far, totally. far less. And I think far more, uh, you know, as we undergo disaster after disaster after disaster, I see it, I see it absolutely happening. And I think that like there's really exciting movement at the federal level in the sense that like there's the U.S. Forest Service has a greening fire team program. Like they're looking at how to get it's similar to pretty much the non-fun version of Burning Man, right? Like travel (laughs) is a huge, you know what I mean? (laughs) Like it's the same thing. They're bringing in thousands of people. Mm -hmm. They need power and they need water and they need transport and they need waste stream management it's literally we use a lot of the festival um like sustainability metrics Mm -hmm. to kind of think through how to do ref you know larger camp sustainability and disasters because it's the same stuff it's bodies human infrastructure that we need to power up with better or use more sustainable sources right so there i think there's a particularly in the wildfire space, there's a lot of exciting um, things coming down the pipe and the federal procurement guidelines are starting to change. So that's like, we're not going to be the ones that are renting, I don't think at scale, 
to the U.S. Forest Service, right? We can, oh, we'll yeah. be help, right, yeah. we'll train, we can help get, we're kind of like the try before they buy, right? Mm -hmm. Go play with this thing, see how it works. Let it, you know, let us know if you need help, that type of stuff. But um, yeah, I think there's, wildfires are tricky too, because, you know, if it's super smoky, we, yep. we've tested it a little bit. Solar panels don't work great in, re if it's dark out, you know, during the day, you're you're looking at a different program. It's not a solar generator. You're looking at an electric, hybridized generator, right? That Which is actually, still better. It's better, but it was one of my questions: is that you know one of uh, one of the differences in wildfires and wind and rain events is that wildfires, of course, we have terrible um, air quality and red skies. For it can be mm. like the Dixie Fire was three months. Yeah. So it can be quite a long time, but sometimes you do get, so I, I, I like, I like that you're looking at a hybrid approach. Um, instead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, and there's, I mean, that's where it's like you're starting to get into commercial scale hybrid generator systems where, you know, we'd love to play in that game and, and be one of the rentors, right. Of those systems. And then, and then send them to the people that can't afford to rent or pay for them. The U S forest service can totally pay for, to rent them. And yeah. we will only sub, you know, we're only there to subsidize these fire departments and, and, you know, the, these larger entities to the point where they adopt it, like the American red cross should be doing this already. We'll happily help them do it a little bit, but we're not going to subsidize. We're not going to greenwash their disaster program. You know what I mean? So um, let's, let's talk about that actually quickly because we have. So we just attended the wildfire uh, leadership conference in Colorado about a month ago uh, oh, for cool. the Red Cross, and um, and I'm meeting with uh, their wildfire person next week um, because they are looking at moving from a sort of. Uh, acute to chronic response and it's going to take it's that's a it's a huge uh, evolution of their services and so uh, we want to talk you know we want to help them formulate their wildfire response in particular but um mm -hmm. i see a i attended a walmart had the first disaster conference they've ever had um in bentonville oh, cool. about four months ago and it was it was um and i attended that because they're one of our funders and they're very actually very nice and um, Red Cross and Walmart, they were at the, they were at the forefront and there were, yeah. FEMA was not there. Yeah. And um, so I see that if, if they're talking about greener energy, which they are more social justice, which they are, and they also mm -hmm. they have a big, they have a big footprint for yep. all, you know, and, and all that that entails, <laughs> yeah. but it's going to take sort of those giants of the industry to adopt these technologies to totally. um, get to normalize it. Anyway, that's what yep. we're looking for. We're looking for normalize, normalizing it, making it um, accessible and not um, um, turning it into one more opportunity for a huge amount of waste. And I actually yep. am very hope. I was really hopeful after that conference and listening to uh, Walmart and Red Cross have that discussion. So yes, absolutely. I think, um, and I, have you um, actually connected with Toolbank USA? Yeah, we've worked uh side by side with him a couple times in i used to be a state leader for team rubicon and they we oh, would okay. play together yeah in uh in the previous couple before i started footprint and the yeah i think there's like that those are these great partnership examples that i think could make really really practical benefits that don't require like a two million dollar hybridized fancy generator thing that cat will eventually build or a Greco is working on, you know, there's people out there that are going to do the commercial power space mm -hmm. and that's fantastic. Just please tell that like, hurry up, you know, <laughs> but the, uh, this, the more, I think the more interesting kind of disaster programming pieces are like how to transition all chainsaws to electric chainsaws, right? Like right. a very simple, you know, there, there are electric chainsaws in home Depot, right? Like there are, it's not, but I own one, but they're, they're much more expensive. Yep. Exactly. And so I got it for Christmas and it's a 16 <laughs> inch. It's, you know, it's, I think it was like $600, you know, they're really yeah. expensive. And but so, if you're running, a, if you're paying for gas at $6 a, a yeah. gallon and you're running 50 crews for six months, right? Like I think yeah. there's that space one, there's as long as you can align all of the, Hey, it's not just cost. It's also the photo. It's also the, the sustainability metric. It's also that equity lens. Like you kind of got to get 
all of those things to get a holistic, you know, a holistic measurement of why you would spend 600 bucks on one chainsaw versus, you know, 200 or something like that. you have to have it though, which means that that's why I'm glad when I see uh, Red Cross and Walmart's leading the space, not just in the space, but actually leading the space and, and those and their values like that, those are on the table what yeah. you're talking about. And I didn't see that in 2020 in the same way or 2018 or 2019. Like I totally relatively new and I'm, um, so it gives me hope. And I think that there are, um, opportunities there. And I, you know, Toolbank USA is looking at doing a West coast, um, hub, a deployment center. Oh, cool. It seems like a natural thing that I hope that you reach back out to them. They just were traveling with us in, um, Colorado to learn where we're working in the Marshall fire. Oh, um, awesome. And then I've invited them. We're going to New Mexico in a couple of weeks um, to work on that fire. And um, I oh, think fantastic. the more times that groups like ours, like nonprofits like ours actually join hands and yeah. uh, work together and de-silo and invite collaborative leadership, then that's actually how we're going to you know, maximize our impact yeah. dramatically. Oh, a hundred, I, yeah, a hundred percent. And I think like my dream kind of, where we could fit or help right i think is like guiding we're we can't we don't have the the budget or the bandwidth to to like do a hun like put a hundred solar generators into service through tool bank right but we could help them think through what the right solar generator thing would be to offer with an electric chainsaw or some other power tool recharging thing like it's it's less of yeah i I would love to get to the point and maybe in a couple years where we're the funding just funding solar throwing solar generators around like candy you know like like uh, if you collaborate though and they have you know they have awesome national relationships you know that collaborative piece where then if you make those requests because like what you're doing is is much more hard infrastructure i always say that what we do is much more soft infrastructure Mm -hmm. Uh, we help Mm -hmm. communities by coaching local leaders on how to lead and find their own recovery but we don't have you know we don't have solar arrays for them and yeah um, um, so, you know, the more that uh, we more often that we walk into communities together with the with both sides of the equation, I think the more um, successful we're going to be. Totally. And yeah, I think it's a great point. I, I think I, we'll have to follow. Okay, <laughs> well, follow I'm, I'm, I'm following up. Yeah, I, I already have like, like four, you know, I'm already <laughs> like, okay, I've got Trey in my brain. I just did a podcast with him um, that's oh, uh, published, so you should um, take a look I at that I met him one. for the first time at National VOAD in oh, uh, Baltimore. Yeah, mm-hmm. so it was really exciting to kind of, I'd, we had visited the Atlanta hub, which was really cool once. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's, it's really exciting to think about kind of what could be done when the generator is not the problem, but like the fun piece of the or the sexy piece of the disaster like no one stands around a diesel generator and you know (laughs) checks their phone and you know what i mean like it's not the cool thing Uh, it's not definitely not the cool kid at the party of the camp right everyone kind of hides them they're all kind of like required you know needed but not wanted Mm -hmm. they're smelly loud it's just an annoyance and once you can flip that and like think through all right this power piece could be the cool piece of the puzzle that you know adds value in all these different ways and is super you know photo oppable like Mm -hmm. everyone loves standing in front of a picture of a you know solar panel it's it it's just a fun there's so many go you can take it and run with it yeah yeah well it just occurred to me do you have equipment stored at chase casuals yeah yeah that's our trailer yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've, I've seen that. I have it on a video. Um, oh, cool. I love the, here's what I love about this work is, um, you know, Chase in Sonoma County where I am, I interviewed him because I like the seventh generation rancher, you know, effect yeah. and, and he's such a smart dynamic guy. Totally. Um, and then, so I know, so that's how I came to, um, find you, but then also you have recently just met Trey for the first time in person. And then I was traveling with Trey just a few, so- like, or five, five weeks ago, whatever it was. And, yeah. um, and so that's like, that means it's meant to, that's kismet, that's good. And um, I think that, I, I mean, I really love, I love 
the idea that we're all taking our little piece and we are um, trying to make it better in that corner of the world. And I applaud you for doing that. And um, and I would look forward to figuring out, you know, how can we be of service to your work and, you know, and how in intros. Um, so we can talk about some of that offline. Okay, Is there well. something that um, I have, I have for the first, I have two more questions in the remaining okay. time that we have. The first one is, is there something I didn't ask you that you wish that I had asked you? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, no, I mean, I love talking about this work. You could have asked me literally anything. I would have like, you know, talked, talked your ear off. I mean, I, I, and I think you, the question that you got to that was, I think the very, very, uh, that doesn't we don't always get to in these conversations is that like what past the numbers like what does this do for communities which I think is often overlooked everyone likes to talk about tech they we never I never had to explain once what a kilowatt hour is which is a breath of fresh air for me <laughs> um, so yeah and it's particularly I think that's a, also a statement on I don't know the uh, techie men that I also you know generally most of the people I talked to about this are white men that like to talk tech, right? <laughs> so that's, there's an equity issue right there. Let's, whatever that means. <laughs> but um, I think, yeah, uh, there's a lot more to, to, like, there's a lot of pieces to this, but the, your questions about what does it mean practically, I think is, and how it frames or what can it do in the immediate phase, not just practically, but also long, you know, almost psychologically to communities oh, to yeah. see something that's the future, like to see a vision of your, your, the future in your, your neighborhood that was just toast, just completely devastated and have something to look at and be like, wow, that thing could be, uh, you know, this is, there's still going to be something better here, right? Like, it's not just going to be pallets of water bottles and chainsaws whirring. And like, that is the, the exciting, most exciting part, I think, about what we need to do. So, you know, disaster work is tough. And um, I would, I, you know, I always like to talk about it a little bit. So when you do this work for a long period of time, it does take, you know, it takes a bit of a toll. And if you don't mind, uh, you know, sharing with the audience, you don't have to share anything overly personal. It's totally your call, but like, um, what keeps you going and, and helps you manage the actual stress of having a nonprofit that works in disaster? Oh, the best question. How to, uh, <laughs> one, I think I'm way past burnout at this point. So it's like, <laughs> you know, yeah. that's, we've kind of, eh, both myself and I think the, a lot of the people I work with um, would say that we're over like there's enough momentum to keep going and we try to find the party like that's why we also like that's why we do like doing events is because as long as this mess is going to be messier and get worse and the climate change is definitely not going away it's gonna you know we're trying to get through 2030 let's what about 2040 and 2050 like this puzzle is is getting really shook up um I think finding those moments of, you know, even if it's a small break, even if it's like the, the, we got to take some, you know, take a night and listen to music at Bonnaroo, right? We were working there, but we got to enjoy a festival for the first time in a long time. And I mean, yeah, you can point to exercise or stop drinking or whatever, you know, like there's a lot of things. Or, you I know, start do. drinking yeah, and start, stop right. exercising. Yeah, it just I mean, it's whatever yeah. you're going to say. It's not, we're not, we're not super preachy on here. We're really yeah, like, what yeah. are you actually doing? Because it's yeah. called how, how to disaster isn't even proper grammar. Like, that should be your <laughs> first it. clue, right? Yeah, so it's like, yeah. what are you actually doing? Because totally. I think that we all get the advice, you know, yeah, meditation does totally work. I agree with that. And, you know, yeah breathing works and exercising does work. Um, drinking can work and it can also be very bad. And yep. so, um, yep. but like, I would like to talk to people about what are you actually doing? Is yeah. It no, it's you, a, which uh, there's not a lot of shoulds. Yeah. I love that. Like one, thank you for ending with that. Cause, um, we, 
or I personally like I've been doing this for not a ton of time, but almost a decade. And it's the same, like you got to find those moments. And I think think for me, it's thinking about the really long game helps like doing a combination of emails about the real long push versus getting outside and like bolting a solar panel onto something for me is like a figuring out the balance between um, building something with your hands, like running a chains, whatever it is, whether it's exercise or for, um, for us, it's like using a power saw or drill to drill a bolt into a solar panel or build something new, really practical versus, you know, finding that balance with sending a hundred emails in one day, like that's where I find the, the enough energy to keep sending the emails or <laughs> drilling another panel and do a stupid ground mount thing to power something at a site, right? Like just finding that oscillation, like the, the balance between the practical and, and uh, writing, like doing the, doing stuff that's change, keep the, keep things moving. Otherwise yeah. it's like you're writing emails for no reason or you're driving a truck 2000 miles for no reason, right? Like the, they gotta, you gotta keep them in, um, change them up and keep it moving. Keep it moving. Well, on the uh, keep it moving note, I think uh, we are um, done here. And it, can you just, uh, I, I said at the very beginning, but can you give the audience that's listening um, your website again? Do you mind? Oh yeah, www.footprintproject.org. And um, yeah, please reach out, particularly if there's folks that are responders or um, aid workers or something and want to play with some a new toy, like that's most of the Thank you for joining us on the podcast, How to Disaster. For more information, please visit our website at afterthefireusa.org. And if you liked this video, please hit subscribe.